deliver the most advanced technology applied by the largest IT companies in the most sophisticated devices in the world, being equivalent to components manufactured in the largest global semiconductor centers. Abby Simi members have also been significantly investing. Roberto, we are now live. Very good. Thank you very much, Rafael. Thank you, everyone, for uh, being uh, uh, in the panel, holding until the end of the day. Thanks, Romano, in particular, because it's uh, it's almost 9 p.m. over there in Belgium, right? I'd like to thank Mike Scavarla from Cornell Nanofabric uh, Nanoscale Facility for joining us in the panel, uh, Professor Ruben Sommer from CBPF, uh, another lab from the uh, Brazilian CIS Nano uh, initiative, uh, one of several uh, uh, open labs in the country uh, involved in uh, micro and nano fabrication. Uh, I believe perhaps he might be in the wrong room. Um, so Rafael, maybe you can invite him back to this room. Um, so we are, there you go. We have a, a, a professor I a now. I'm yeah. going to be, uh, welcome back. Uh, we seem to have lost one of our panel members. And so I think uh, uh, we, we have a surprise for you. I'm going to be acting as one of the panel members as well. Um, let me uh, share the screen here. And uh, if we allow me to um, show the slide, the introductory slides for our panel. I hope you can see the slides. Our panel today will discuss with some key experts um, the uh, role of uh, open labs or multi-project wafer foundry runs in developing technology development products. Um, this, of course, is not a fight. Um, we are here to discuss all the possibilities. And uh, I am chairing this panel together with my colleague, Professor Davis William Lima Monteiro. He uh, is having internet connection problems, so he'll be joining us shortly, I believe. So basically, the agenda is we'll, we'll, we'll have this brief, brief introduction. Each panelist is going to show uh, a few slides and discuss their views and their institution and the scenario. And then we'll take some questions by the answer. Uh, please do post your questions on the Q&A uh, window and then we'll wrap up some ideas and conclude, okay? Thank you. Let me show you uh, what the goals of the panel are. We're basically going to be discussion, discussing two approaches that are widely used nowadays to, to, to develop and provide access to high tech to academic and industrial users. These, these, these two standard ways are open access user laboratories where outside people from you know, uh, 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 that institution can come in and somehow have access. That happens in many different ways. And we have here some, some examples. We also have another approach, which is you know, very expensive facilities, foundries provide access to their runs through a broker or you know, access to their own facilities. And I think we have an example of that also going to be shown here today. Um, and the focus that we gave to this panel is to explore, you know, more than CMOS, more than more tech type technologies, because that is a, 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 an exciting area, an area where you don't have a lot of uh, facility and access uh, available. Although, of course, uh, CMOS discussions are welcome uh, by the panel. So let me start introducing uh, 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 Dr. Romano Hoffman. He uh, uh, is a researcher with uh, with uh, IMAC, and uh, he's done his master's degree in uh, the Netherlands in molecular sciences, his PhD in radiation chemistry, uh, also in the Netherlands, and uh, has worked in Philips and uh, NXP uh, previously, and has been involved in many areas, including CMOS integration. So, um, 
Thank you, Romano. Um, I'm wondering whether I should present one by one and then let you talk. Should we do it that way? Okay. Yeah, okay, we'll do that. And then next time uh, uh, I will uh, present, well, no, sorry, Roman. Sorry, guys, let me, <laughs> let me briefly introduce everybody, okay? Uh, so we have Mike Scavarla. Mike is a staff uh, uh, at the Cornell Nanofabrication Facility, one of the uh, uh, labs from the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure in the United States. Uh, he's been working at CNF for very long, as you can see and uh, has had many roles there and has some uh, research projects uh, uh, of his own. And he'll be uh, joining us from Ithaca uh, uh, shortly as well. Uh, let me uh, show you uh, the next speaker will be uh, Dr. Ruben Sommer. He's uh, a researcher at the Brazilian Center for uh, Physics, CPF. And uh, he has done his uh, uh, school, all his school scenes in the south. And then he changed rivers from the Rio Grande to Rio de Janeiro uh, uh, somewhere. And uh, after a stint as a postdoc at John Hopkins, he's uh, uh, involved, uh, he's uh, the coordinator of the uh, Brazilian uh, Lab Nano at CDBF from the CIS Nano facility. And finally, our, our panelist that couldn't join us today is uh, Professor Flavio Plintz. Uh, he is uh, a physicist who's done uh, bachelor's and master's, uh, uh, well, his bachelor's in Minas Gerais, his master's and PhD here in Campinas. I am here in Campinas right now. And he joined the staff of uh, uh, UF, the Federal University of Minas Gerais. Uh, he's also been part of the uh, uh, Ministry of Science and Technology Infrastructure who uh, 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 installed this uh, CIS Nano project uh, back in 2013, I believe it was. So um, we would like to welcome in case he shows up. If not, uh, the surprise is that I'll be joining uh, you guys as one of the panelists. Uh, I did my bachelor's and master's in physics at San Carlos. I did my PhD in electrical engineering at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Um, I'm currently a researcher at the uh, uh, CTI, where I co-lead the, uh, the, the CTI's nano laboratory uh, of the CIS nano uh, uh, network of, of labs. Um, and I lead the photonics uh, group here as well. Um, I did my postdoc at Unicamp, and then I did a lot of things related to Cornell. I was a staff member at Cornell, CNF, I led the MEMS uh, group of, at a startup working at Cornell at CNF. And then I joined the uh, uh, nanophotonics group at uh, the electrical and computer engineering at Cornell. So I was a, a local academic user. When I moved to Florida as a professor, then I sent my students. So I was an outside user academic as well. So yeah, uh, I guess that's why Michael accepted my invitation. So with that, let me move uh, 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 the talk to uh, Romano, please. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen somehow. There you go. Romano, yep. please. Thank you. Good. Thank you, Roberto, for the introduction and also for uh, well, introducing all the panelists. So I'm the first one to speak about Euro practice, um, and more in particularly the foundry services we do in the area of more than more. Um, so Euro practice, we also call the trusted one-stop shop, which enables microelectronic innovations by academia and startups. So that's really the part we focus on. Euro practice is already quite old. Uh, so it was launched in 1989 under the name of Eurochip um, by the European Commission. And it was uh, meant to promote microelectronics in Europe. And then since 1995, we operate under the name Europractice. And yeah, the, the Europractice is actually abbreviation, which stands for promoting access to components of systems and microsystem technologies for industrial competitiveness. So the industrial competitiveness is quite important, although the focus is really, as I said, uh, academics and, uh, and startups. And then since uh, Three years ago, the consortium consists out of five partners. So the traditional partners, which are IMEC as the coordinator, being myself, then STFC in the UK, Fraunhofer in Erlangen, uh, CMP in France, Grenoble, and then Tyndall in uh, Cork, Ireland. 
So those five partners serve an entire uh, ecosystem and you can see here all the members in Europe. And I have to stress that also the fabrication that we offer is open to um, yeah, countries outside of Europe. So also startups and universities from US, from China, from other places can, can join and have things manufactured. So you can see there are a bit more than 500 dots on the map. And what we provide to, to those places is really an, um, an area of technology and innovation. We support them very actively. We train them and we also bring outreach. We do that uh, through a network of suppliers, which provides design tools, design IP and prototypes. So that's the manufacturing, mainly through MPWs, as you will see later. And this, yeah, in the end, um, yeah, makes that we can offer industrial grade prototypes. So that's important. It's industrial grade. And that will also be important for the discussion later on. It also enables collaboration with the industry. We train the workforce, mainly in the EU. We support also innovation in the EU and we enable European startups. So that's why we do it. So how do we do that? We have three pillars of the service. And the first one and the most important one from my perspective is the fabrication. Also, and today we will zoom in there the most. Also then the access to design tools. And the third pillar is training and webinars. The webinars we just yeah, launched in the COVID area because normally we did classroom trainings and that was not possible anymore. So now we also offer a lot of webinars. If you zoom in in more detail on the fabrication service, then you see on the top the ASICs. So you can see that's yeah, the, the, the biggest junk, the most foundries are there. Also the big foundries in the world are there and we offer access to their MPW runs. And for most of the foundries, we also offer um, yeah, smaller and medium size uh, volume production. So the most important foundries here are TSMC and Global. Um, although I would say XFAP, if you are interested in analog and, and more sensor type of, um, yeah, it could also be interesting. But again, today we speak about more and more and that are the ones at the bottom. So traditionally we started with MEMS, with MEMS Cup. We added recently XFAP and Tyndall and you see that Photonics is the biggest junk. So there we have seven foundries that offer pho photonic services, mainly silicon photonics, but also silicon nitride photonics and photonics on glass. The photonics on glass is steam photonics. And if you think of glass, you also can think of microfluidics. So also microfluidics has been added here. And this is IMT from Switzerland that is offering that. And then very soon, we will also uh, offer uh, thin film transistor technology from Pragmatic in the UK. Uh, all of that is complemented with system integration so that people can also integrate it in their system. If they cannot do that themselves, we offer them uh, special services like three or two and a half D or 3D integration, uh, photonics packaging, so really uh, optical fiber uh, bonding to the, to the chip and even bonding of, an, uh, of a CMOS to a silicon uh, photonics chip. Then also microfluidics integration and MEMS integration. So then zooming in a bit more on multi-project wave service. So like I said, almost all the fabrication that we offer are done through multi-project wave service. Why is that so important? Because you share the cost with different customers. There are different designs placed on the same mask. And therefore you not only share the mask cost, but also the fabrication cost. And that brings down the cost tremendously to give you an idea, for instance, a 22 nanometer um, from Global Foundries or 28 nanometer from uh, TSMC, you can really get uh, for yeah, $10,000, you can have one square millimeter. So you can really, as a small player, start to do your prototyping in those technologies. Well, if you had, had to do it on your own, you probably had to pay a few million on the table. So you can see that's why uh, multi-project wafer service is important. And like I said, most of those technologies are also available in small or medium-sized volume. So you can also grow. Right? It doesn't stop with this few samples, but you can upscale if you need to. Then if you zoom in more on MEMS or silicon photonics, then always the question is about standardization versus customization. So like I explained in multi-project wafers, you share uh, designs on the same mask, so in the same technology with different customers. 
So you cannot customize everything. You really need to take what is in there in that run. Yeah, but again, if you have more customers, it can allow for more technology flavors in MPW mode. So there will be more runs and you can play a bit. Or you have the model of XFAP, which have mod modules. And so what they do is actually they put more wafers in a cassette in an MPW run, and then there will be splits performed. So there will, you, you can, for instance, say, I want to have this layer and the other customer doesn't have that. So then you split the, the cost still a bit and yeah, still are able to customize it. Uh, then if you zoom in more on, on MEMS, I would say there are three models and the most, yeah, the two models in industry are the proprietary model. And so there are big MEMS factories like Bosch and analog devices, and they do customized product development, for instance, for Apple. Yeah, so they really make a dedicated MEMS for that customer. And that's so specific that it also cannot be bought by someone else. Then we have the other model, which is open access model. That is, for instance, through MPW. So there we had, like I showed you, the MEMS Cup and the XFAP. And that typically you have smaller customers. Of course, you, like I explained, you cannot do everything. So you need to take the flow as it is. And you need to differentiate through your design. Of course, that yeah is a limitation, but still, as I explained, it is affordable, and you also don't need to yeah pay NRE and 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 these kind of costs. And then the third model is the research model. So there you have university labs or um, yeah research labs where they do uh, fundamental research. And then I would say yeah most of the, the 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 people who benefit from that are students or researchers, and so for fundamental research. But not so much, I would say, the, the the industry. But that we can discuss later on. Then uh, recently we have announced this new MEMS process in MPW mode from XFAP. And what we did to promote that is an, um, a design competition. So we opened the floor to universities and, uh, and industry to yeah, send in uh, proposals for, for designs. And then the best design would get a free MPW slot on the first run. In the end, we got um, yeah, quite a few interested parties and we decided to have three prizes. So you can you can find it on the uh, on internet in the press release who were the winners. So like I said, it only is not sufficient to do stimulation actions. It's also important to train people. And so like I said in the beginning, we have classroom trainings and they very, really uh, from different topics, from analog IC or digital IC design, verification, but also photonics, TCAT, and uh, multiple IC technologies or MEMS technologies. Then in COVID, we went for webinars. And as you can see here, we did um, a first webinar series consisting out of six webinars on microfluidics, uh, six webinars on silicon photonics, four webinars on MEMS, and then now very soon we will launch a new webinar series on flexible electronics. All those webinars can also be watched on our YouTube channel. So if you're interested, you, you I invite you to have a look there. And if you're interested to join the Europe Practice community, we also have a LinkedIn channel. So there you can, uh, or a LinkedIn page, and you can just follow us and yeah, really get track of what the newest technologies are in the portfolio or new webinars, etc. So again, to conclude, uh, what I think is important for yeah, newbies, but also to promote new technologies and especially more, for, more than more technologies are promotion and stimulation and then provide low barrier access. So cost efficient access, but also to provide training. So these are the three pillars that Europractice provides and which are very important. That concludes my talk. Thank you very much, Roman. That was very clear, very nice. Uh, so a broad range of uh, technologies being accessible, some which I hadn't paid attention uh, in the recent uh, uh, times, uh, not my area. So very interesting. Uh, now I think uh, we, we are going to invite Mike Squarla to, to, to share his screen and then make a presentation of the NNCI and CNF in particular. So Mike, I think your tell of your phone is on mute, and uh, we also just need you to share the screen. There you go. We're we're seeing your your uh, screen with all the slides now. 
but not the presenter view. Let's see if that works. I think you might need to uh, uh, go into presentation mode before sharing the screen. Yeah, I guess. You might, you might wanna, yeah, cancel that, go into presentation mode and then. So um, while we wait for Mike, uh, can we check if uh, uh, Professor Flavio Plentz is in the office? Can you turn your microphone on, camera on, so that I I, I know to, to invite you, Flavio? So yeah, there you go. Yeah. Welcome. Glad you made it. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah. A little bit late, but I'm here. Thank you. Okay, great. So we're gonna have you as the fourth panelist then. Hopefully, uh, 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 everything will run smoothly. Okay. Uh, yeah. So Michael, um, do you want to do it? Let's try this one more time. There you go. Okay. And it's uh, you got the right display. Not really. Swap them. Yeah, swap them. Let's see if that works. There you go. Fantastic. Perfect. Ah, technical problems. Uh, so uh, I'm going to represent the CNF, and uh, this is the second or the third arm uh, that Roman was talking about. These are sort of beginning students. These are uh, very simple projects, uh, very simple concepts. Uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity, and uh, I am representing the CNF, so I want to acknowledge the cast of thousands. And Apologies for the pronunciation, para algo complementary diferente, uh, completely different. So I have a presentation which is completely different from the existing ones. Uh, if I could define the conference so far, I would use the word precision. It is perfect. Uh, incredible sophistication and precision. If I could define what academics do, I would use the word play. Uh, so there's going to be some casualness to this, but uh, I'm going to discuss academic-based research. And again, I, I uh, echo the concepts that Romano put on. We've got this, these captive uh, activities with large customers. Uh, you've got these broken down uh, sections of foundry work with the smaller customers. And then you've got the students. And, and we're going to emphasize the students. Uh, one of the big points we make is that we assume everyone who comes into our lab has no experience whatsoever. So our job is mainly education. And along the way, they will pick up the concepts and the technology so that they can understand how to move to the next level. So when I see product development, product means a lot of them, many for sale, development means a few. So I'm gonna suggest that, that product development requires both. Uh, and it's a seamless project description. And so it's in sort of a gradual evolution of a concept to a prototype, to a foundry, to mass production. So I'm gonna to, to emphasize the shared concept. And we have many projects that are now straddling that border. Uh, just uh, a few days ago, we got a project from a company called OWIC and they're moving from lab to foundry. Uh, they developed this over a period of several years as part of the research and PhD programs of four students. It, it's an optical wireless integrated circuit. The thing is mobile. It is self-propelling. Uh, it has optical communication. There are all kinds of activities that go on, which I can't discuss, but it is a mobile communicating, analyzing, sensing device. And that sort of illustrates where they're sitting. This is on the verge of it. We have other projects that are just moving into 2D semiconductors and quantum physics. They're all in the experimental laboratory stage. Uh, this one, uh, several years ago, moved to a foundry. Uh, it has taken that route that I just described. These were energy harvesters for very small app, local applications, uh, and it moved from a development project at the CNF into a foundry, and uh, they're making, as far as I know, quite significant ones. So uh, historically, academics and, and education was recognized. It poses advantages to society, not just the philosophical, 
but also the practical. I mean, schools have been operating for thousands of years, universities continuously for thousands of years. Uh, ideally, or historically, we've been isolated, but in the last century, we started to sort of organize. And that's because of either political or economic concerns, but we've been organizing into it. So the question is, how do you get this, this natural evolution of thought? And the attributes of the academic field is access. The, the watchword is access. In, in the beginning, you're talking about access to faculty, access to labs like ours, which are established and have a, a long uh, repertoire in different uh, specialties. We have research programs that have been going on for years, students, support staff. So education is versatile and nimble. When you get to the production, you need to be disciplined and you need to be professional. And, and those non-competitive areas, I think, are ones where we can collaborate. Uh, as I said, a big point with the academics, we assume no prior knowledge. Uh, so we start from nothing and we offer cost-effective research. Uh, you want cost-effective research, there are several options. So the option I'm posing is the academic. Uh, and uh, we are typical of most of the facilities you'll find. We are hands-on. Uh, we are research enabling, meaning we do not do research. We merely support research. Uh, we provide fee for service. So you want to do something, you pay a fee. Uh, there is a soft cap, which essentially limits your financial exposure. This is very valuable to entrepreneurs and small companies and, and startups. As I said, we provide access to the technology. Because most people are not experienced, we provide experienced staff support. This is the bedrock of how these projects develop, because without that staff support, it might take quite a bit longer. So uh, in most cases, it's crucial for that. We do have also low barriers to entry. We're interested in philosophy. Uh, we're not interested in the details, so we don't peer review, we don't evaluate. All we do is say if it's feasible within the constraints of our lab, uh, it's allowed. Because people do their own work, we don't attach any IP. Uh, we have no knowledge of your fabrication techniques, nor do we want any. All we wanna know is that if it's safe and uh, compatible with the lab. We are open equally to everyone worldwide. Uh, and again, emphasis, no experience necessary. Uh, how do we start these things? There always has to be direct communication because quite often folks have an idea, but they haven't put flesh around it to, to sort of explore what's going on. So we have uh, several staff members get together in a weekly tech session. We'll talk about options. As I mentioned, our only criteria, feasibility is within the constraints of the tool set. Uh, and then obviously safety for people and safety and contamination control for tools. It is a complete toolbox. We have uh, well over 140 tools uh, and it consists of uh, several tools I'll show you later. Uh, the, we are a node of the National Nanotechnology Coordinated Infrastructure, which is just a collection of similar facilities operating with different uh, business models, but with the same concept and that is fee for service and hands-on research. Uh, so academics provide access, industry provides money. Uh, I've got some cartoons to sort of describe the, the motivation behind a lot of this. This trillion dollar a year market is based on the fact that most people spend most of their day watching a screen. Uh, this is not what we do. We make these sort of fundamental devices and every device we make is one or more of a combination of these things. There are some ways, some are actually basically nothing but energy harvesters. Uh, others are measuring devices that take a temperature or a pressure. Some are MEMS mechanical devices doing something. And so you have a brain that controls all of this and you have some communication. So this is the fundamental one. Again, not Hollywood, uh, but these are simple things. And, and I wanna use these, these sort of uh, collages to give you a sense of the, the distribution because the breadth of our lab is the thing that uh, we, we sort of, uh, uh, focus on, and that is because if you see something that someone else has done, it might impact your thinking on uh, your project in, in particular. So uh, very small, uh, simple lasers, energy harvesters. Uh, this is a zero mode waveguide, which is the foundation of a two and a half billion dollar business now in the United States. And it started out as a research project 
and it went very quickly through us, the foundries, and now it has its own captive manufacturing facilities in California. We actually make guitars, musical instruments, labs, bodies on a chip, uh, models for biological systems, biomimetics. Uh, the money has always been in health, in, in, uh, in biology and medicine. And so a lot of the projects are essentially physics or engineering projects that have an inclination toward biology. Uh, photonic crystals, a uh, variety of things. This is a sensor for the brain. Uh, this is a bionic eye. And, and uh, it really is an attempt to communicate directly with the uh, uh, genetic or uh, genicular nucleus of the retinal of the optic nerve. And these are the electrodes that are designed to do it. This is not just a post. It is an engineered structure, probably takes 30 or 40 different steps and 10 masking levels to produce that. A lot of comb drives, various other things. This is the OWIC that I was talking about. We have exercise machines for cells. Can you see my, my cursor, the pointer? Yes, okay. So we have exercise machines for cells. Uh, things that might be normal. People have been looking at fuel cells for 100 or 200 years. Uh, but in this one, it's a little different. Lactase electrodes, glucose oxidase, that doesn't sound like electricity. That sounds like a body. This is a fuel cell meant to be put inside a, a, a human a, or a live animal and to extract energy from its uh, electrochemical system and power uh, other entities that are put inside it. Uh, this is a very interesting one. Uh, we started with very simple designs for binary optics. It moved into advanced microscopes and telescopes. And in this particular case, at Rockefeller University was developing a sectional microscope where you could look at individual sections of an animal and correlate the action of a neuron on one level to a neuron on the other. Now we have billions of neurons. We're not easy to analyze. However, e, uh, C. elegans only has 36 neurons. And so this is an attempt to analyze the, the, the neurolog neurological behavior of this very simple worm as it's going through some very simple concepts. If you look at the sections, you're looking at nine vertical slices. The top slices are motor neurons. And these are neurons where the worm is recognizing it's either moving along or it's trapped. And as you see these neurons fire, they've been decorated with a dye. So as you see them fluoresce, uh, you'll see the neurons firing. The worm is essentially saying in the top row, uh, I'm stuck. But in the bottom row, they're sensory neurons. And so the worm is now always smelling for food. So it wants to move and it wants to eat. And so as I go through this, you'll see a few seconds. But what you'll see is that the top neurons are firing continuously. The worm is recognizing it's stuck. And then all of a sudden, it smells food on the bottom and immediately forgets about being stuck and decides it's waiting for a meal. So I'm gonna put this in video and you can see the neurons on the top firing and then down at the bottom, nothing happens until there's this burst of uh, chemical at that bright light you just saw there. Uh, that was a burst of chemical. The, the virtue here is that you can actually correlate with these advanced optics uh, tools, you can correlate the movement, the uh, action of one nerve and the firing of another. So you're actually having a conversation with a worm. Uh, it was invigorating. Uh, I'll show it again. I don't know if it'll be any more intellectual, but they, there are the neurons on top, the motor neurons, I'm stuck, and then the sensory neurons saying I smell food. And these things are correlated so that when the sensory neurons fire, the motor neurons wait a while and say, maybe I'll stay here, uh, might be fun. Okay, uh, so when we're talking about these processes, uh, folks often come to us and say, what can nanotechnology do for me? The answer is, I don't know, but I can tell you what it's done for others. So I'm just gonna show you a collection of slides uh, and then end my presentation with uh, and uh, ask for questions. This is our lab. Uh, we were the first site in 1977 for a national laboratory. Uh, we evolved through many manifestations. We are evolving from electronics, which was the basis. And now we investigate all avenues of, of research, acoustics, piezos, MEMS and NEMS, nanobio, photo, uh, steady stream of visitors, and again, cross-disciplinary. So we have a number of people. Uh, it, it is a cast of thousands. Uh, in any given year, there are three or 400 projects <clears throat> and six or 700 researchers who are active. Spans worldwide, as I said, they're open worldwide. 
Quite often, folks from far away don't come here, but do remote. Uh, but nevertheless, we are available. Uh, and we have uh, hundreds of publications, patents. Again, it's an educational activity. And our goal is to provide uh, education and knowledge. Uh, projects can come in and sometimes work for a week or two. Uh, they can last for weeks or months, and some of these can last for years. The number on the date on the Bionic Eye project was 1997, so it's 25 years old. There is a project actively running, 111-80. You can't see it, I don't think, uh, on the screen, but it's been running for 45 years with the same professor and the same concept. This is a uh, random uh, magnetic random access memory, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting history. And clearly all of the technologies that have been developed over the last several decades are transmitted to other students and it provides this fertile ground for, uh, excite, for exciting research uh, and, and exciting knowledge. So uh, a lot of staff people, a lot of tools, advanced lithography. I don't wanna get into the weeds of this just to say that uh, we, we focus on versatility, we focus on a wide breadth of, of uh, involvement for both people and tools. Uh, 3D fabrication, 3D visualization, state of the art. So I'd like to end there. Uh, we can talk about details and different projects as we go on, uh, but it's a good place to break. Thank you very much, Mike. Uh, that was a very extensive and uh, a, a nice history. Um, Great. Uh, if you can stop your, your, your sharing and then we can move on. I'm going to wait to, to get all the questions at the end. So we'll do a round of questions with everybody, if that's okay. So for now, I want to call uh, Professor Sommer to present uh, uh, CISNAM and CBPF. Thank you, Roberto. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Yes, now we are. Okay. Thank you. So, uh, my contribution to this panel will be introduce a little bit who we, we are, uh, CPPF and the Lab Nano facility, and uh, some of the basic uh, um, principles for our operation. And then I'll present some uh, uh, information about the, the Brazilian uh, ecosystem on nanotechnology. Uh, I'm glad Flavio is here because Flavio Plant is one of the responsible for the for this structure to to be available and running today. Uh, okay, okay. No, I cannot change my. Okay, so this let's skip this. Uh, uh, this is Rio de Janeiro. This. Uh, Botafogo neighborhood, the Sugarloaf, and CBPF and the, the Lab Nano is located here. Very nice place, but you can imagine that we don't have that much space and you cannot do many things because we are packed in a, in a, in a campus uh, where we do have several institutions, uh, the Federal University, the State University, and the Military Engineering Institute, but uh, we cannot grow that much as we, as, as much as we would like to. Uh, CBPF is um, it's a Brazilian Center for Physics Research. It was founded in 1949, and it's the National Institute for Research in Physics, its application and the related fields, not only physics. And the Labinano is the first Brazilian nano center, although it's a small nano center. It was created as a complete facility with some facilities of fabrication micro nano fabrication and characterization with electron microscopy. Uh, we also use the our synchrotron uh, uh, facilities in Brazil as an example. So we always remember that we we work as an open facility. Uh, the, com the, the the academic community uh, presents a proposal for work, and there's a peer peer review system in house. 50% uh, of machine time is made available to external users of CBPF. And this is a rule since the beginning of the CISNANO is now in the second round of the CISNANO labs, uh, what our MC2, MCTI calls uh, CISNANO 2.0. Um, there, there is a space for companies also to, 
to, to, for purchasing time, machine time, and to develop, to make joint developments. And uh, it was, this system, this lab was imagined as a regional strategic facility to boost fabrication and characterization to often the structures which focus in electron beam lithography and analytic electron microscopy. <clears throat> It's available to users from the whole country, so although it was regional, it, it's everybody in the country can apply for. Um, it's the unique open lab in the Rio Janeiro area, Rio Janeiro state, and the second in the whole country because I guess only Lab in Nano, CBPF, and L and Nano, CNPN are open labs. Um, there are more, but I don't know if they work exactly in the same way we do. <clears throat> Uh, there is a strong user education program. We we do have uh, similar to what uh, Michael just presented. We don't do things, but we teach people how to do it. So it's a hands-on facility, um, and we have a shared and growing knowledge base. So things we do, it's is shared with the other users, and this knowledge is growing. Unless it's is is uh, is made under contract with a company then it's not shared of course and the 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 axis of action we do this uh, research and development in, in, in internal research and development but also with the the external users i'll show you in a few minutes a constellation of labs we have in at cbpf and how labinano is integrated in that we have a strong user education and tutoring yeah? The, there are electron microscopy courses. This is also needed for hands-on on the electron lithography, electron beam lithography. There are nanofabrication courses, specialized, specialized schools, and mostly individual user training and tutoring. And we also invest, work on technical capabilities and improvement of our infrastructure. We started small, now we're getting bigger and bigger with better equipment and uh, this is good but we have a limit so sometimes you have to ex just exchange for an, an equipment for a new one but you have to give the other away and we have a uh, work it with uh, uh, companies we are members of the Cybertech Nano network it's an innovation network associated to this is Nano Labs uh, we have several technical cooperation agreements with companies the oil company, which is located in Rio de Janeiro, put a lot of money <clears throat> from time to time. And we provide services paid to companies. And this is also a, a, a source of uh, funding for the, the other activities of the lab. Uh, we have several research areas now, uh, not only by the staff of the lab, but the, the staff of CBPF. We are working on nano and microfabrication, magnetic devices based on AMR, GMR, TMR, spintronics and magnetoorbitronics based devices. Uh, there is a strong foundation on magnetics in this lab for historical reasons. Uh, micro and uh, nanostructured devices for microwave, magnetic crystals and for electronic applications, magnetization dynamics, nanomaterial synthesis, instrumentation, nano size and nanotechnology. We have a master speed program on on scientific instrumentation at uh, CBPF. Uh, there, there are groups working on biocompatible nanomaterials and nanotoxicology. Um, the lab is this big factory, this big structure here. We have some uh, sister uh, structures that work together. Some, some of our equipments are located in, in some of these uh, other uh, big labs. And there is a multitude of labs uh, from the institute that work together and use uh, the facilities of the Labinano, okay? So I will not get to into detail because, but we have clean, a clean room, we're improving clean room, the electron beam system is working, a good electron microscope uh, with several facilities and uh, that are only available at CBPF. And, uh, um, okay, in another moment, we can discuss and can show you more things if you are interested. Uh, now, let me show, change quickly, quickly the subject and discuss a little bit what are the main programs of our Ministry of Science and Technology, and uh, that 
and uh, what is the ecosystem of the nanotechnology labs in Brazil. So the, the, the most important programs may be related to this uh, subject of this panel are under this uh, general coordination of uh, uh, it used to be the coordination that uh, Flavio was the head a few years ago. And uh, we have a, a, an ecosystem for the nanotechnology. Yeah, there is the Brazilian Nanotechnology Initiative, the CISNANO ne Network of Labs. There is the Cibratec Nano that are innovation centers connected to these nano labs. I will talk about it a bit more. There are some re uh, networks of research in nano systems. Uh, that is wor people working on reg nano regulation, and there is a, a advisory committee that uh, works for uh, helps to establish the 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 programs in uh, within the ministry. I'm a member of this. Uh, we also have some uh, uh, network for the certification of nano products, but there are other related. Recently, it was created the National Network Initiative of Photonics, with several uh, several uh, labs that are uh, were um, uh, were now allowed to participate in this initiative, and there is a. Equivalent to the CIS Nano, there is a, the CIS Photon. It's a new, new, new structure that's still going on. And there are other, uh, another area very important, which is which where Nano is is a part of it, which is material advanced materials. Uh, there are some uh, some some priorities that are priorities of the government, but Brazil has a lot of activities in this field. And, uh, and there is also a, a, a program on uh, advanced manufacturing. So this is, um, this is a, a, a new initiative. There was no such a thing in the, in, inside the ministry, okay? Uh, sorry that some of the, the part of the text is in Portuguese, but uh, um, the Brazilian uh, Initiative on Technology was created in uh, 2000, uh, 13. Uh, Flavio was there, Flavio Plants was there, and it was um, consolidated. I mean, we call that in Brazil institutionalized in 2019. Okay, but in practice, this, this initiative is running uh, since 2013, in the way it is. Uh, but there are uh, there are investments and programs in nanotechnology since the early 2000. So, so our lab was created in 2005. The idea uh, of the lab and it was inaugurated in uh, 2010. So before this, so from time to time people relaunch these ideas and these initiatives. Okay, this is part of our ecosystem in Brazil. The CIS Nano, yes, it is an important structure that Flavio was at the, at the beginning, what we call that at the CIS Nano 1 today. Uh, the first phases of CIS Nano was uh, in 2013 to 2018. And the second phase, they made uh, another call for the labs. We had uh, 64 proposals from 65 institutions, research and, and institutions and universities. And we have now eight strategic labs, 12 uh, associated labs, mostly at universities, and three strategic partners, which they call that uh, there are companies or uh, labs in private institutions, not necessarily companies. Uh, the money, I, I don't want to talk about money because it's too few, okay? Forget this, six million Rio is nothing. It's a million dollars, it's, 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 this is nothing. This is the real problem today. We are getting a lot, much less money than we got before and then what would be needed. But fortunately, there is, when the federal money goes away, uh, we can get money and funding from the state agencies. This is happening now with Sao Paulo and Rio de Janeiro, or there are, uh, FINEP was, uh, put some, uh, it's a federal agency, but it put some money, very heavy money a few years ago. Uh, so we are surviving, 
this is in terms of that okay now in terms of the 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 brazilian alien you know that the amazon is in green the amazon area is in green there is just one lab this is the first lab this this federal institute of amazon it's a it's a technical uh, 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 college uh, there are three labs at the north uh, uh, east and northeastern area on the federal university of Ceará. this uh, uh, the regional center for strategic technologies in northeast which is seteni at pernambuco at recife and there is this senai cimatec at bahia um, at the, the concentration of labs is much bigger at at the southeastern brazil where we do have 14 labs in sao paulo minas gerais rio de janeiro and uh, espiritu santo are this this area that is uh, painted in in red uh, we do have three strategic labs in rio uh, CPPF, the Metrology National Institute, and the Insti National Institute of Technology, concerned mostly in uh, nanomaterials and nanocomposite. And there is one small company that uh, was uh, accepted as a strategic partner, partner that is Nano Business. Uh, at uh, the Minas Gerais State, there are only UFMG, this is the university of uh, Flavio and also uh, one of our shares, and the Federal University of Uberlândia, okay? Uh, in Sao Paulo, there are more, because there are CNPEN, the, Na the National Center for Research in, in Energy and Materials, where do we do have our Syncontron, our National Nanotechnology Laboratory, and other facilities, CTI, Renato Archer, which is uh, the, Renat the Pan uh, Paliputi's uh, Institute, Embrapa Instrumentation at São Carlos, the, and the National uh, uh, Nuclear uh, Commission that have several labs, uh, not only at São Paulo, but uh, Minas Gerais and uh, uh, Rio de Janeiro. And also, we do have the, the, the associated uh, uh, institutes of uh, the associated laboratories or institutions that have uh, very big facilities, USP, Unicamp, sorry, uh, the Technological uh, uh, Institute of uh, Sao Paulo, EPT, e, and there is also a partner here, which is uh, this, uh, the Einstein Hospital which is that has a very strong uh, research area and uh, in the uh, center uh, west area in yellow there is this federal university of goiás nearby brasilia uh, in south we do we do have only the federal university of uh, paraná curitiba uh, federal university of santa catarina a federal university of uh, rio grande in, in the, the deep south and there is a partner also at the, the catholic university of uh, porto alegre uh, uh, which is um, it's uh, is a private university okay Ube, so, uh, if you don't mind i wanted to speed you up so that we sure, have time sure, sure. Just, just quit uh, i talk too much i'm sorry and uh, finally associated to the cisnano we do have a, a, a network of innovation centers that have funding to support joint projects with companies. You know? So all these CIS Nano Labs can, uh, can, can, can enroll to these networks. And we do have two networks, one of the nano devices and the nano sensors. The other one is nanomaterials and nanocomposites. Okay? We are now running on the 10th cycle. We have a lot of projects, a lot of applications. I'm, um, I'm the head of the nano devices and nano sensors uh, uh, a network and uh, in this project they are for a small project but they are there enough to, to 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 run the money is enough to run the project in a two-year base okay it's 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 one of the success we, we do we do have and so about the question uh, of this panel it, 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 it open labs or multi-project water funder runs I, my view for brazil yes 
But it's important to have funding and proactive actions from our ministry and other agencies uh, uh, with their related funds. The key in Brazil is that we do have money, we do have funds, but for political decisions, they are not being used, okay? Sometimes the Ministry of Economy keeps the money that of those funds uh, closed, and, um, and this is our problem. But we're still alive. This is the point. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruben, for that uh, uh, overview of the Brazilian ecosystem. And for our last panelist, uh, Professor Plans is, is here now, and I wanted him to uh, present uh, his overview as, you know, kind of father of the child for this is Nano, but also his view on innovation and how companies make use of these capabilities. Professor Flavio, the word is yours. Okay, so I'll share my screen. So can, can you see it? Yep. Okay. Uh, so I will give a talk you know, about my experience, basically using, using many, many user, open user facilities you know, in, in, in several places. Uh, let me see if I can put... Enter options, please. Okay. So my name is Flavio Plants, and I will talk to you about my experience you now uh, running this project. There is a project for biosensors that needed you now to make, uh, uh, to process you now uh, graphene field effect transistors, but in large scale, okay, using full graphene wafers instead of this you now. Uh, is small batches that we can do basically you know, in the facilities that we have in Brazil. So in the physics department, you know, we do have you know, a, a reasonably good uh, clean room, but we can't process like full wafers. You know? And we can do this with a lot of uh, reliability you know, that, that, that was necessary for this project. So, uh, what we did uh, uh, was to use many facilities. No? One of the facilities was the Cornell nan Nanoscale Facility. No? Mike is here. No? He may remember me uh, for some time there at Cornell in, I think, was 2018. No? But we also use it, no? a lot of EPFL, no? Center for Micro and Nanotechnology, and, and the Stanford Nanofabrication Facility and Stanford Nanoshare Facilities. So I've been working you know, in, in all these facilities you know, in order, in, in order to, to, to deliver you know, what was needed. We also used you know, the, the, the LNANO, that is the, the National Laboratory for, for Nanotechnology to dice some wafers. And, and, also, and also some other labs, like at the, the CDTN, there was a CISNANO you know, uh, lab, and also a partner at the Fiocruz, that is the you know, a, a biotechnology and bioresearch, you know, very important institute in Minas Gerais. So uh, uh, the idea here you know, was to put the focus on the problems, on what we have to, fo to, to solve, you know, in the technological gaps you know, that, that we have to, uh, uh, to overcome and not you know, in, in managing a facility, buying equipments and, and nothing like that. So what we had to do was that, you know, was to do graphene field, field effect transistors uh, in full wafers. You know, and you can see here you know, an old example, we, we don't do this kind of ships anymore. But you have you no know, the metal contacts and the graphene uh, uh, in, in the graphene uh, uh, transistor channel here you know, on the top of the wafer. But the problem you know, was that it was very difficult. You no, know, it, it is very difficult, right? To uh, to process graphene wafers, you no know, real graphene wafers, not the graphenes that that make you know, yourself in your lab, you no. Know? 
all the commercial uh, uh, graphene wafers have problems. You no, know? they can't stand, for example, developing. You no, know? it's very difficult. They can't with with uh, they can't uh, uh, go through. You can't go go through a lift off process. You no. Know? Without detaching, no the graphene. So uh, uh, this was an old example. This was 2017. You no, know, on some ships we did at EPFL, you no know, uh, CMI EPFL. That 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 was the first lab we used it, you no know, to 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 start you no know, knowing and, and processing the full wafers. And as you can see, you no know, very bad results, you no. Know? Uh, but in the end, what we needed to do, you know, we need to do a ship like that. This is a real ship, you no, know, and to process those you no know, full wafers uh, uh, with you no know, monolayer graphene on top of the full wafers, and do in this case it is a four layer process. So we have you no know, development, you have lift offs, you have the deposition. In our case of uh, an SU8 layer also, that was the third uh, uh, lithography layer. So we had to develop all that, you know, and basically develop all that you know, using as much as possible uh, processes that were like industry standard. So we would like to have in the end, you know, a processing, uh, 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 Technology, you no know, methodology that we, we could in the end put into a foundry, you no, know, and and do the processing, you no, know, for you no know, thinking about really producing large scale. And for our project, you no, know, we did that. It was really necessary to have like you no know, hundreds of those ships working, you no, know, because we didn't want to to have like one or good, one, two, three, four, you know, 10 good ships, because we need to do statistical validation you know, of the biosensors, you know, of the detection uh, of you know, the, the molecules or, 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 or the, the disease. So we had necessarily to have a lot of good ships working. And this was impossible to do in Brazil. So it was impossible to do, we didn't have the infrastructure. So we looked into basically you no know, Cornell, Stanford, EPFL. You no, know, those are the, the three labs that we use it. You no, know? and in many in each each lab was used at one stage of the process. Cornell, for example, was used in 2018. You no, know? uh, EPFL was used in 2017, and then it was used last year, you no, know, 2020. I got you know, uh, uh, permission to, to travel to Switzerland and stayed there for like you know, four months doing, doing all the processing. And, and here, as you can see, you know, from a very difficult process you not know, to carry on, we've, we finally got you know, a, a process where we can do, we can really do you know, with 95 you know, uh, percent of yield, you no, know, uh, uh, very good uh, uh, graphene field effect transistors. You no, know? here you see the graphene channel. You no, know? here is the substrate. Here are the metal contacts, and here is an SU8. No protection layer. No covering. No, no the covering the the metal contact. So we could do the, uh, could do that no only because we had those open shared facilities available uh, to us right and the transistors no we can fabricate like no uh, full wafers with no hundreds and even uh, uh, depending on the size of the ships no uh, we can do up to 2500 ships in one wafer which is pretty good, and uh, and graphene devices you know, that look very good. You no, know, we look to the to the expected uh, uh, response you no know, of of the of the uh, graphene field effect transistor, and you you get you no know, very very good you no know, Dirac 
uh, at point curves here. And you can see, you know, here is an example of detection of the Zika virus. You know? We can see that you no know, uh, uh, red here, you no, know, it's it's the the bio ship, you no, know, the the biosensor, you no, know, that, that goes through some functionalization steps, you no, know, before going before being ready for detection. And here you can see, you no, know, when you put like a sample containing you know, uh, the Zika virus uh, uh, a protein you know, that we choose that protein to detect, you, know, you can clearly see that you no know, displacement in the transistor curves, right? So uh, we can also do this you know, for, you no, know, this is a most recent work, you no? Know? We can use like, you no, know, if, if you look all those curves here, you no, know, when, when you look at the curves by eye, you, know, you can't really recognize you know, a standard or it's difficult to say what's detection, what's positive, what's negative. You know? But when you take those curves you know, and use like you know, neural net network, machine learning software, you, know, we, uh, you can uh, really detect with up to 85 or even 95% precision uh, 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 the desired uh, uh, target. So in this case, the target was Zika, right? And the Zika you now is completely separated from all the other in the specific proteins, you no know, CEA, dengue, or okay, that are separated here, you no, know, in this 2D plot. Uh, by the neural network software, right? This is another example you know, of detection uh, using like a uh, human serum. that is a very inespecific you know, fluid. Uh, and the human serum, serum with the, the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein. So you can see you know, that when, when you compare, you know, the, the, this is, this is uh, this is not a standard way to detect. No, here we apply a, a, a short pulse to the device gate and follow you no know, the, the 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 behavior of the current in the channel. And by doing that, we can see that you no, know, uh, when you have only human serum, you have the black curve. When you have the human serum plus the spike SARS-CoV-2 protein, you have the red curve. So this, you can clearly uh, differentiate you no know, between uh, the two situations you no know, and you no know, this can only be done you no know, statistically uh, uh, validated you no know, if you can do things like that like process a full wafer dice the ships you no know, and then use the use the ships you no know, and do a lot of ex of experiments you no know? So we use it for this, you no, know, the Stanford, you no, know, uh, uh, nano fabrication facility, uh, the Stanford nano shared facility. That that this was very good because you no, know, the Stanford and uh, nano fabrication facility has all the you no know, the the the, uh, uh, the device processing lab like Cornell, but at Stanford they have also this nano shared facilities that has almost everything you can imagine uh, regarding uh, device and, and materials characterization. So this was a very good combination to use. No? You can know they are right, no? one, one almost in front of the other, and you can have access basically to everything you need. So typically, I would go to Stanford and stay there like between five and six weeks, and when I, came, when I came back to Brazil, I had all my wafers you know, ready to, to be used here in Brazil in the next steps of the bio, biosensors fabrication. I use it also EPFL. So last year I was there you know, doing, you know, I fabricated many, many you know, wafers. And, and those wafers are being used, used now in, in, uh, in the project. And also Cornell Nanofabrication Facility, also that, that I mentioned. I was there, you no know, working uh, a postdoc 
of ours at the time was there, Jorge, and Tiago, another postdoc, was there also using the, the facility. And some parts of the process were developed here you know, in the Cornell and Fabrication Facility. And in the end, you no, know, in our case, it would be impossible you no know, to, to develop the fabrication and have and have our devices without access to those open labs. So uh, in the end, I would say that product development, open labs, they are absolutely essential. You no, know? and, and in my experience, you no, know, on those labs, you no, know, very straightforward, you no know, process to have to, to access the facilities, you no. Know? Uh, I would say that within one or or two weeks, you are basically ready to you know, to take your flight and go to the lab. You no, know, you have an account there. You no, know, you use the lab. You no, know, at the end of, of the month, you receive an, an invoice and you pay for for the use. You no, know? you you have you no know, always you no know, very good assistance from from the staff. You no, know, from all the labs. Uh, the my experience was extremely good. On that, you no know, fast training and learning curve. So in my case, I was experienced user, uh, but I would say that even for a user that that has little experience, you no, know, he can be up and running very fast. Okay. So in my case, for example, within like two weeks, I was basically running my process. So going through all the trainings, all the learning, everything. And basically one, one very good thing that all the equipments are very well maintained and the process baselines and standard recipes are very well established and periodically verified by, by the staff. So this in my case was very important because uh, basically I, what I did like you know, uh, 75% or 80% of the times no, was to take the baseline process, the standard recipes, run those standard recipes, and then from those recipes, no, make the necessary adjustments for those recipes to, to be compatible with the processing of the graphene wafers. That was the very difficult thing. So in the end, I got no, my, my technology, my methodology, well established, but using no, basically no, the, the standard processes that, that were available and you know, bunching and, and, and doing the, those processes in the right way for graphene. Uh, complete or almost complete processing and characterization, and characterization equipments available. Basically, uh, you have everything you need at your hand. And in my experience, for example, you know, for a very heavy use of the labs, you no. Know, it was about ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars a month, you no, know, for uh, foreign academic projects. So this was very good because when when I say very heavy use, it was that I was like typically working you no know, ten twelve hours a day, you no, know, using the labs equipments, processing equipments, characterization equipments, uh, uh, chemicals, you no know, resists, all that included. And all, all, all the times I was using those labs was very intensive use. And, 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 and I would say that this is a very good uh, 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 cost benefit relation you know, uh, for your project, because you can really focus on what is your job to do, that is to find uh, uh, the solutions uh, uh, for the technological uh, uh, breakthroughs or for the technological gaps that you have to uh, to go uh, to go over to to uh, to make your your devices or or your project work. Okay. Uh, so now what we have? You no. Know, so well, those those were the the last wafers that I fabricated. I fabricated those at EPFL. So we get you no know, uh, the GFETs, you no know, uh, fabrication using basically you no know, industry standards, you no know, because uh, 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 this was uh, something we 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 needed to do. Uh, full flexibility for different designs, and this is very good, you no, know, to have those complete those those labs that are very complete. You no, know, so you, you are free you no know, to let your ideas fly. 
and test things, no, and, and many different recipes and different equipments and different processes, uh, combinations. But since you have everything is there, this is this is much faster to do, no. And and this this was what made no large scale validation possible. No, that was essential thing for us. No, because we have we really have to have like statistical significant results. You no, know, in order to have uh, a biosensor that you no know, you eventually put in the market, right? So this is an example of wafers you no know, uh, uh, fabricated at uh, APFL last year. Okay, so uh, this is was this was what I, I would like to to show you. And, and, and from my point of view, in, in Brazil, we are you know, very, very far away, very, very far away from have you know, anything like Cornell, anything like you know, Stanford, anything like EPFL. Uh, and I would say that we don't need like more than one lab like that here in Brazil. And I would say that, uh, this uh, the cost of having a lab like that in Brazil is very high. No, I would say that maybe two hundred million dollars. No, to you no know, to build the lab and other like twenty million dollars a year. No, to get you no know, that all the staff, all the lab running. And I would say also you know, that what makes the difference is not the, the the equipment that's there makes difference. Yes. Uh, the facilities, the buildings, the clean rooms make difference, yes, but you have to have you not know, very good stuff, you know? and this is the key point you know, from my experience. You no know, finding you no know, very uh, uh, very well uh, uh, trained and very and very good and very in, in, in people that really want to put your project you no know, moving. You no, know, this is was uh, the essential thing to have, I think. So that's it. Thank you very much. Could you stop sharing uh, uh, your screen? Yeah. Uh, Professor Plains, just one question. Uh, did you use steppers uh, during those experiences at Cornell, Stanford, and EPFL? No, when I was uh, in Cornell, we considered you no know, using steppers, you no, know? but we didn't. We we didn't really uh, uh, had like. It would be too complicated you know, to, to make a, a process that is compatible to, with steppers, you know, because the stepper you know, requires you know, a, a much more standardization in the process than, for example, a mask aligner would require. You know? So and it's really not necessary because you no, know, we can you no know, using our process, you no know, using you no know, a, a a mask aligner, no, it's a really fast. I, I, I ask because we did we did have at Saytech uh, a couple of steppers uh, working mm -hmm. in the Grande do Sul. I'm not sure if you've ever visited that uh, their lab. Mm -hmm. Okay. Have you ever visited the Saytech? The Saytech, no, I, I I never I never was there. That's no. a pity because uh, they I would say that they're as good as Cornell as far as their facility. Well, they were. It's a uh, it's a pity. Very good. Um, I guess we can move on to the questions uh, um, uh, session. I prepared a slide with some of the questions that I've collected, and I uh, will share that here. And uh, if new questions come up, uh, we can maybe address them. I've coded them such that uh, I believe you will be able to uh, recognize your initials. And uh, we can perhaps actually, yeah, let's see if you can uh, see this. Whoops. Can you see the, the questions? Yes. Yes. Great. Um, so uh, the first question uh, was for Michael and for um, Romano uh, regarding, uh, I guess it's a real debate, which is which one can generate more, faster, or better results for startups for product development? 
which one's going to take it first? Uh, I, I can echo, and I'm very pleased to hear Flavio's work was a success. I can echo his experience is typical. Uh, I think you absolutely need the research areas, the open labs to get an idea of what you need. But once you have that, uh, these foundries are unbeatable. And I argue that uh, his, his Flavio's comment on statistics was, was spot on. You need to have many, many devices. And I think the foundries can give them to you with a lot better control than labs. So uh, our problem in the, the academic labs is there are a lot of people and they change the specs. And so day to day, you might have slightly different values for etches, etch times, et cetera. So I argue you work in the national, in the academic labs to understand the process. And once it's fully characterized, go to a foundry as soon as you can. Yeah, I'm fully aligned with that, uh, Michael. So I would also say that, um, and I would use the term T TRL, uh, technology readiness level. Mm -hmm. So the ones in yeah. the open labs, they're typically, you can try out things typically at uh, lower TRL, but then once you really want to bring it to the market, so once you have like a spin out of the university or spin out of a research institute as a startup, then I think you need to think about upscaling and then you come automatically in, in the foundry model because like Michael explained there, you can not only yeah, uh, produce more, but also more reliable. So the process control is much better. And if you would need processes that are not available in those foundries, you can still choose to do some post-processing on top of the wafers you have produced in those foundries. And those could then still be processed in the open labs. Huh? So I think both of them, they go really hand in hand. I agree. You're almost forcing me to show my slides that I had prepared, but <laughs> let's move on. <laughs> uh, what good. is the next one? Michael, I think uh, there's a question for you is how many different projects can run in parallel? You mentioned many different numbers, 400 projects, 600 people. How does that work? Well, the 400 number is over a year. Uh, in a given week or, well, let's just pick a month. In a given month, uh, there might be people who do things on 150 different projects. At one time, the number that can run parallel, uh, typically once the lab hits 30 people, it's jammed. I argue that uh, the number of projects that can run in parallel is at most a dozen because they're all going to be knocking heads on individual tools. So at one time, a dozen uh, over the course of a month, well over 100, between 100 and 200, and then collected over a year, you get contributions from uh, about five or 600. And uh, these people come and go. Uh, it's, it's nice that it's open. And if, for example, uh, like, again, go back to Flavio, the work he was doing, if he needed time on tools continuously, he could switch to the evening hours where there was no operation. And so he could get Time on tools. That's what people do. They go to the hours that that best uh, suit them. So, uh, as I said, on average, it, at one time about a dozen, but over the course of a, a week or a month, it's it's well over a hundred. I'm going to bounce that question to Romano in a in a way. If at one of those standard processes, say photonics or fluidics, uh, how many projects can you jam into a wafer? Um, how many wafers? How many cycles you do per year? Yeah, so that depends really on the process. So it's um, customer driven, I would say. So if there are many customers, so to give you an idea on some of the TSMC processes, the for, take the 65 nanometer. No, the non-CMOS, uh, Romano. Non oh, the non-CMOS, okay. Um, oh, the, the, the amount is not that big, unfortunately. So I would say for MEMS, we typically have uh, two runs uh, per year. And then there are... I would say three flavors and that's it. So six runs in, uh, in total per year. For photonics, there are a bit more. So at IMEC, for instance, in our own facility, we have, um, I think, three active runs and two passive runs. And then, like I showed, we have six other foundries where there are uh, photonics uh, Let's runs. Pick Let's pick MEMS, for example. Uh, yeah. On one of those runs, uh, uh, how many different projects does the MPW uh, take? Well, if we never fill all the slots, so typically we have, um, I, I think you could take like uh, six or eight projects, but typically we have only two maximum. 
again, the demand is not, not high enough. And, and that's so many people, I think, still use the open labs uh, to do MEMS. The transition of MEMS towards to foundries, many, many people are reluctant to use uh, foundry technology, MPW technology, because they are limited to yeah, the, the, the process that is offered in that run. And they simply yeah, want to twist it and do something else. Mm-hmm. And that, that, of course, is only possible if you do it on your own. And then if you go to the foundry, it becomes very expensive. So then they typically stay in their own lab or go to an open lab. Fantastic. Let me switch over to yeah. uh, Ruben. Uh, Ruben, uh, I kind of think I know the answer, but there's a question here whether you can manufacture a MOSFETs and small ICs at CBPF or in any facility in Brazil that you know of for that. Um, at CBPF, uh, in principle, you could do. It was never done, Okay. And, uh, but not not circuits, not integrated circuits. This we don't have uh, facilities for that. But now, if you want to prove a concept, try to make using the, the 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 tools we have. You can do it, and you can characterize it. We do, for example, uh, in uh, magnetic tunnel junctions with very good quality, with a very uh, thin layer of uh, uh, an oxide. Uh, but um, it has was never done. So if a user can apply for it, we can discuss. So, so he uh, has to work hard with us to to get it done. So, so, no... so, but do you have an ion implanter or means to do the diffusion of the N and P dope regions on a semiconductor? No, no, we don't have facility for for semiconductors in general. We can do whatever you can do using physical methods, deposition methods. The nanolithography system, etc., and special substrate, you can do it. So, for that reason, I say that you can do some a few things. Okay. Yes, yes. Yeah, SATEC had that uh, capability, but I guess yeah, it's not going to be available. Well, about SATEC, how is SATEC, what is happening to SATEC? Maybe you can uh, brief us what is going on. Can you? Um, I can tell you what's been published. Uh, all the staff has been fired, the technical staff. So we do not have any more technical staff, which were uh, capable of doing that. And I understand there's going to be an online public audience to discuss the future of the actual laboratories, where you have all of the capabilities of physical deposition, ion implant, a couple of uh, uh, steppers, and I can show slides of the work we've done with them, where they fabricated some of our photonic uh, structures and also MEMS devices using SU8 over there. Um, unfortunately, those are not going to be available, I guess. Um, it might be that the equipment is sold uh, to uh, entities abroad, even. So it's really a dire situation. It would be very important for us to show as a community the need uh, uh, for such a facility in Brazil. As Professor Plant said, we don't need that many of them. We need no, one no. very good one. One good uh, one. That is able to run wafers. And uh, SATEC runs six inch wafers. And uh, we've ran, I actually have 75 of the wafers right now in my lab. Unfortunately, uh, we can't process them further. So we'll see. Um, there's a question for uh, uh, Professor Plants. Uh, Professor Bumpy mentioned that uh, there's several researchers, Phil Wong, Mitra, among others, um, Stanford, that have fabricated CPUs with 50,000 logic gates with carbon nanotube fats. He's wondering whether you actually received any uh, uh, technical scientific advice for, from anyone at uh, Stanford on subjects related to that. Yeah, no, in fact, no, no, uh, because no, to process uh, a carbon nanotube wafer, you know, especially the way they do at Stanford, you no, know, they, they grow those those aligned carbon nanotubes in special quartz quartz four inch wafers. They have seeds and they grow the aligned carbon nanotubes. The carbon nanotubes is very well attached, you no, know, to the substrate to the oxide. So you don't have any problem uh, processing that in, in, in the sense that they don't detach. You no, know? uh, graphene, uh, on the other hand, you no, know, it detaches. You no, know? if 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 you put like you no, know, uh, if you do you no know, the normal development, you no, know, it will detach. You no, know? if you do a lift off, you no, know, it will detach. So you have to really manage to have uh, uh, to modify those those steps. You no. Know? 
uh, to, to make the, uh, those steps compatible you know, with the processing of, of graphene devices. I guess the point of the question was whether you had technical or scientific support. Oh, from yes, the, yes. From I, I, I had like technical assistance from the staff, no? The staff, so, right? Not from the professors, right? No, 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 no not the professors. Very good. Very but, good. There's another question from Mike Scavarla regarding the CMOS IC node for MOSFETs. Well, I can, I can say that in 2001, I helped, uh, I think I can say that, right, Mike? Please LSI, do. LSI Logic, we made yeah. uh, 7 and 11 nanometer gates on the E-beam system, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we did hybrid mm -hmm. lithography. I don't know what you guys are doing there now. Do you have an updated number? Uh, no, I, I argue that it's staying the same because it's all basic, uh, basic research. I think uh, the high-end things, the, the 5 nanometer FETs, uh, we don't address, and that's just because we don't have the... The sort of the infrastructure control for that. And again, you go back to uh, 50 students a day coming in and out, tracking in mud from the garage. It, it just happens that way. But people are making FETs. This debate when you were there even was uh, the debate about, do we have a baseline CMOS process? Uh, the answer is no, we don't, but we make CMOS chips and we make MOSFET devices. And these are all very specific to the researcher themselves. This, these, the, the folks who are making devices with actual uh, electronic characteristics, uh, these are people who have been doing it on their own in our lab for years, and they really know the details of it. For the casual researcher, I argue, uh, there's too much background that needs to be filled in. Uh, we do have people who are making uh, devices. The OWIC device has dozens or hundreds of transistors. It's got ICs, uh, it, uh, logic gates. It's got uh, it's got uh, optical receivers, uh, timing chips. It's got mechanical motion. So there are MEMS devices, and so these, these sort of integrated processing are specific to the researcher. There's no uh, lab-wide baseline CMOS. System in our lab. So the researcher brings the technology node with him, right? Yeah, I would argue the researcher develops the technology node there as a necessity to get their work done. And it just naturally evolves. I've watched dozens of people do this. It's beautiful to watch because they start with a very simple concept. And, and after two or three years of work, uh, are, they are perfect. And in fact, there was one I talked to today uh, who is taking his work on 2D semiconductors uh, and just starting a simple company that uh, has gotten some significant funding. Uh, it's all very specifically evolved, uh, but the lab itself does not fund that, does not support that. I want, I want to ask a question to, to, to all of you, with, which is uh, 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 the pros and merits of this uh, 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 comparison of uh, the review merit uh, that uh, the L Nano does, the Cis Nano does on the projects, right? And the fee for service, irrespective of what the idea is or you know what the scientific or technical merit is. Can uh, uh, Ruben, can you uh, uh, tell us a little bit why why is it reviewing the merit of the proposal important? Uh, yes, uh, in, in principle, it, it depends. This is the answer, so. In principle, it's important to avoid waste, you know. You have to see if the guy knows, he made some research, he knows what he's doing, if, the, if there is merit on that, and if it makes sense. Because you may receive in an open system, you may receive anything in principle, okay. But you but, guys charge for that service as well? Uh, for what service? Excuse me? For, for whatever you are evaluating. No, no, no. That's a waste. No, 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 no. We don't, we don't, we don't let them do things that are not reasonable. This is the idea we have to discuss. Uh, but if it, if you have a company, you want to try something, you can pay, you can uh, purchase time, machine time. Then yes, you have some. Once, if you don't compromise the equipment, you don't contaminate. You can try, okay. This is it, but uh, there are rules. You cannot uh, go over that those rules. And if you pay, you have more access, and that is yours. Uh, if you pay for a project process, if you pay, 
the images, everything is yours. You know? It's not part of, it's protected, it's not part of, of our knowledge base. But there are very few users that do that. The, the users that pay in general are for electron microscopy, not for, for nanofabrication. Nanofabrication is mostly academic. Very good. Okay. Michael, well, do you want to comment? Yeah. Or, or I don't know who, who. What I would say is that no, in, uh, at Cornell, Stanford, and EPFL, they didn't you know, verify, they didn't go through the merits or scientific merit of the project. They go through the, feasi the feasibility of the yeah, project. This right? is more important. Only that. No, if I go to Cornell, no, and 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 tell that I want to do some like weird like chemical etching, no, that is impossible to do there, or that would require very special uh, uh, things. They no, they would say to me, no. In fact, not the first thing I did when I was there is to have a meeting with the staff, no, mm -hmm. to review the steps and and to see if the steps are are feasible, no. Yeah. At the PFL, no, you have to make a run card, no. It's not no a definitive run card, but you have to put no your ideas there, and they'll say, okay, this can be done, this can be done, no. Uh, for example, I want to etch like. Graphene. They may say, "Okay, we don't have equipment where you can etch graphene." And so this is feasibility. So this is definitely not all the labs do. But to analyze the merits, so, no scientific merit, no, and 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 in fact, this for me is very good, you no, know, because this simplifies the project very much. The application process is very simple. And in the end, you no, know, you are responsible for what you are proposing, right? You no, know, it has it, it if it has scientific merit of their technology. Well, you're, you're paying. It's up to the people that are funding you. Exactly. Uh, if I if I if I can yeah. guess what Michael is going to say is that right? We don't Thank we don't you. evaluate the merit. NSF already did, right? Michael? Yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the it. Merit yeah. is no one has already done funds. that. Okay. Yeah. Very okay. good. Um, I guess as for foundries, there's no beginning question, right? <laughs> there well, might be we, we, yeah, well, we do it only once we have this uh, stimulation action, yeah, so that we, we try to motivate students to or, or companies to go in a certain technology, and then they also come with applications. So then we review the merit, but otherwise, we just do the standard design rule checking making sure that there are no violations and that it uh, can be produced but of course that's no guarantee of the quality of the of the design exactly very good yeah. i have a question for romano yeah what is the minimum space that uh, an independent entrepreneur can purchase on your runs um in which technology in mems mems yes yeah, I I think it's ten by ten uh, millimeter. So one hundred square millimeters. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah, I, I we have several folks who would like an experiment to try something like that. Mm -hmm. Since they're not confident of the full characterization, they're reluctant to invest a lot of money, and that's where I have gotten my opinion that you really need to have a. a strong hand on your process flow before you go and contribute a hundred thousand dollars and, and uh, get a significant run yeah but if you go on an mpw run it's uh, quite cheap huh? so in memska process i think you can do it for five thousand ah, dollars okay. and in the xfab process so then you can do inertial sensors there you speak about um, around ten thousand uh, dollars all right yeah those so are is both affordable, I would say. I agree completely. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. Um, I, I think I'm going to open for questions among the panel members. I can see that's a, a, a fertile ground, perhaps. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? Well, I have a question to all the others about the open labs. Um, how can we stimulate uh, consol consolidation so that we don't because what you see is that there are many duplicate labs, so as I as I call it, 
and it's maybe better to yeah to to merge and to to join forces how 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 can you well optimize that yeah the yeah. ncci uh is devoted to that what they're trying to do is act as a real network by standardizing their processes and one of the things we've been talking about over the years is how do we port a process from one tool to another uh and we've had collaborative work, mainly because instruments go down in one location, but we've been sending uh, samples back and forth between sites. And the goal and the resolve is to make sure that you can get the same process flow uh, in every site. So there is a great deal of emphasis on that. The problem is that the most academic labs are, are kind of strongly controlled by the local academic community. So one area might them. One area might be strong in devices. Uh, Stanford Lab is in Silicon Valley, so they naturally have an inclination for devices and large-scale integration. Uh, we're, we're here at the vet school and the medical school and uh, uh, the uh, biotech research center, so our inclination is very versatile, very nimble, a wide variety of fluidic circuits and biosensors and things like that. So Every area has sort of different expertise, and that's based on the local environment. But we do strive to consolidate, not in location or in funding, uh, but to have systematic uh, agreements across the network as to what a deep etch should be, how much resistance or not resistance, how much selectivity you have, uh, various hardcore methods of the process flow. Uh, and trying that. It's, it's a rough call because, again, you have these local uh, motivations, but uh, it is, we recognize it and resolve to address it. So I am seizing the opportunity of being the chair and I'm sharing the slides, some slides Super. that I, I have, mm -hmm. because I think it, it goes towards what Romano just asked. Uh, uh, we have an open lab here at CTI. Uh, it's also part of the CISNANO. I am the vice uh, uh, coordinator of that lab. And uh, we have a micro nano packaging and all of those capabilities. Um, we have additional capabilities to do uh, uh, opto, uh, uh, electronic, organic. And uh, so what um, I think the point that uh, to, to what Romano mentioned is the capability of doing um, uh, these are, these are images from Cornell's uh, uh, annual lab, right, Mike? Um, I color coded by stepper and e-beam lithography here in yellow, uh, showing here that uh, there's a large number of uh, uh, projects that use either steppers or e-beam, but also both uh, doing mixed uh, lithography. I know I did my share of those. And uh, so uh, this is a breakup by uh, areas of uh, different areas. And foundries, as uh, Roman already mentioned, there's a bunch of capabilities uh, uh, to do very high volume of some standard processes. And Romano said the thing that I thought was interesting, which is uh, to do, you do a baseline process at the foundry. And we did IMAC, I I'm showing here on the top left corner, mm -hmm. uh, an IMAC passive run. And we brought this device home and we did further uh, uh, steps. So we fabricated micro heaters and then we connected to those heaters and then we wire, bond wire bonded the hell out of them right? <laughs> to, mm -hmm. to test these devices. And that is the kind of thing that uh, uh, you can do. At SATEC, we fabricated passive uh, uh, runs on silicon. We also fabricated silicon neural probes. And, and these things, uh, this on the left, uh, SATAC fabricated the baseline uh, trenches, and then we brought that to our facility to do the next level polymer depositions and whatnot. So I think uh, there's a lot of room for bringing together uh, foundry steps. And I don't know that you guys have partial runs, right, uh, uh, Romana, that perhaps, you know, the uh, Cornell people could use to finish their MEMS using their flavor technologies or... Mm -hmm or Flavio using the graphene stuff. How, how, how do you see that? Sorry. Which speaks? Romano, what do you think about partial runs? 
Um, well, it's possible. So I give the example of uh, XFAP, uh, where they do the module possible. Well, you can insert different modules, but then it comes at an extra cost because it means that the that user, that customer, needs to provide extra wafers. So we need to put extra wafers in the cassette, and then you can do a partial run. Yeah, and then you could even get uh, a whole wafer. You're muted, Roberto. Remember that there's a, a, a fee and then you can, for an extra thousand euros, you can get a full wafer with only your design, yes. right? No, it's not only your whole design. There are then still the design of other customers as well. They will be have to clear it out um, by us because they yeah. are IP sensitive. We don't want to share those designs with you, but that is possible. But again, that comes at an extra cost, but still it's much more affordable than if you would have your own run. Exactly. So I remember yeah. we purchased full wafers and uh, I know the price increased, but we yeah. paid a thousand euros for a full eight inch wafer uh, uh, cleared of all the other designs. So, exactly. so Michael, it, it's very possible, Mike, to, to, to have, you know, partial steps done and then have one of those splits be sent to you without the further steps, right, Romano? Correct. That is for sure possible. That's very interesting. Thank you. Very good. Yeah. So let's we talk, Michael. Mm. Yes, sounds good. We now have yes. Very good. I was told that we need to finish at 1735. So I'm going to open up uh, uh, for the uh, uh, other, uh, well, for the community to see if there's any later questions. Otherwise, we're going to have a caipirinha. Professor Bump is mentioning the information regarding the uh, uh, SATAC, which is uh, uh, that he has uh, understanding that they are going to be liquidating not only the equipment, but also the whole facility. So the, the infrastructure, the clean room and everything. But uh, I heard somewhere some time ago, someone called me from the MCTI and uh, that person uh, mentioned, oh, we have to publicize say tech i mean it should be run by an organization social organization like uh, cnpm for example or the synchrotron and so it seems that 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 didn't happen right so say tech is going to be really closed i think um there's a lot more people in the audience that know more details about this but from my understanding there will be a, a social organization oh, and uh, taking care of some assets but it's going to be primarily focused on the ip and um so yeah the design area is that correct uh, bumpy or somebody uh, yeah I'm, I'm not i'm not familiar with what was going on with SATEC. i'm just uh, sad so, that yeah, the, 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 the details were published on July 15th. Oh, okay. And, uh, I read it. So that has to do with... with so it's not the, for the whole facility then? It's not for the whole facility. Okay. All right. I'm sorry. I think Brazil should have one, one facility capable of doing not all of the... No, not all things, but some of the things or some of the runs. And uh, but, uh, uh, well, uh, yeah, no, I think, yeah, in, in my opinion, we should have, but we are very far away from having one. Uh, yeah. And I would say that that you know, the best thing we could do is to stimulate you no know, uh, Brazilians to go there you now and use Cornell, use Stanford, yeah. use the PFL as we did in the past with ENL, right? Yeah, 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 that was important. ENL was like was was kind of complicated to use, right? Because it was not like hands-on and things like that. But if we could do agreements, you no, know, and, and and fund people to go and use when 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 this mass of users and mass of results, you no, know, and mass of necessity, a mass of people that know what they need, what they are doing grows, no? Maybe you can get a facility. We there. can think about a facility here, no? Because the, the full operation of a facility like that, no? It's very it's expensive. Very demanding, you know? It's very complicated, no? In um, the United States, Professor, where Fraser, you have... I, I, 
First of all, I have to disagree with you that we don't have one because I visited SATEC and I've collaborated with them and they have a full facility. They had staff and it cost the staff to run the facility in Brazil at the salaries that we have cost, and I have that number, 10 million reais per year. That's very little money. And the facility is there, was there, is there. It's ready, it's operational. And 10, 10 million reais per ano, that runs electricity, that runs salaries, and that runs water. So uh, we have a facility. It's a pity that we're allowing it to just go down the drain. But you know, we have a facility, but no, say tech is a microelectronics facility. It runs. No, six... it's a microfabrication no. facility. Okay, I can, I can go there. No, I can go there with my graphene wafer. No, with gold on top. No, and run this wafer in this facility. I, I don't know if I can do that. No, because you know, no, they when can run everything Alpha, for example, but the gold. Huh? They can run everything but the gold. Yeah, but no, when you go to Cornell, when you go to Stanford, for example, you have separated equip equipment. No, you have microelectronics equipment, the equipment that is flexible. I am, I'm very familiar, Professor Plants. I yeah. ran a, a no, startup I, that used so, Stanford yeah. as well. Yeah, so I, I mean, uh, this but no i i would like to have a like facilities where, where you can go inside no and have full flexibility of you know, working on your projects this, this is well, I'm, I'm glad you want that because that's what we are about trying to get the brazilian uh, academic and industrial facilities right so uh with that um, I want to thank uh, uh, Professor Romano, Professor uh, Mike Scavarla, Professor Broom, Professor Plentz. Uh, uh, I think we're going to break out to another room right now. And with that, I want to end the session, uh, thanking all the speakers that stayed with us. And uh, have a great evening, everyone. Take care. Okay. Take care. Thank you. Very nice to talk to Bye. you. Nice to see you again, Flavio. Okay. Hello. Oh, we're going to a breakout room. Don't leave. Oh, okay. <laughs>